Our Prophet وسلم, taught us when entering the masjid to say, Allahumma ftahli abwaab rahmatik. Among the supplications is, O oh Allah, open up for me the gates or the doors of your mercy. And this may you know, require some reflection of us because of everyone on earth, those that are at the most blessed, the most potent for mercy places on earth are you because you're in his masjid. There's no better place on earth to access Allah's mercy, right, than his house. So then why do we still say, Oh Allah, after you're here, grant me access to your mercy. Perhaps of the benefits here is to recognize that nothing will inherently grant you Allah's mercy without his help. Even the masjid itself, right? Even the Quran itself, you begin it in the name of Allah's mercy. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So that he may open up for you the gates of mercy through the Quran, right? through your attendance in the masjid. That means we are forever locked away from our own well-being. We have no access. We can't strong arm any of it. We can't will it into, there's no hack for this stuff. You know, you don't have access to Allah's mercy unless he grants it. The default is that it's not inherently entitled to you. It's not. And that is why the Quran says, مَا يَفْتَحِ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ مِنْ رَحْمَةٍ فَلَا مُمْسِكَ لَهَا وَمَا يُمْسِكْ فَلَا مُرْسِلَ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ That whenever Allah opens up the gates of mercy for someone, no one can withhold that mercy from reaching that person or that group of people. And what he does withhold, nobody can ever unlock it. And so I, I want to pause in these few minutes and say we cannot overlook this treasure. We cannot let life pass us by without recognizing what Allah wants us to recognize that everything is out of reach and everything is locked away and everything is a dead end except what he who of his names is Khairul Fatihin, the best of openers, permits for you, unlocks for you, opens up for you. You know, but you also want to recognize that in this ayah, Allah began with what? The fact that He opens doors, not that the doors are locked. Right? Whatever door Allah opens of His mercy, nobody can withhold it. Withhold it. Because He is constantly opening. He is not just Khairul Fatihin, the best of openers, that's it, of His names in the Quran, but He is Al Fattah. And the meaning of Allah's name, Al Fattah, as opposed to Khairul Fatihin, the best of openers, Al Fatah is the one that is constantly opening up doors for you. Constantly unlocking, constantly removing hurdles, constantly easing your path, day and night, recognize it or don't, awake or sleep, Muslim or Kafir, Allah's unlocking. He loves to unlock and He's always unlocking, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what He unlocks, nobody can ever get in the way of. I remember one of uh, my preferred authors I was reading for him, a contemporary scholar who said that his friend, the doctor said to his friend, take your daughter or they said your niece home and just let her be at peace. She has like six weeks max, just let her, young girl. So they took her home and they listened to the doctor, try our best to have her conclude her life in the most peaceful way. He says, the author, it has been two years since the doctor said it is a dead end, there's no hope, just take her home. And it's been two years, she's still alive, and both the doctors presiding over that patient have both since died. He's the one who unlocks doors, and he's the one that closes doors, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He always was and always will be. You know, you even think of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we often read, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the victory of Allah came and the fatih. The Fetch here is the conquest of Mecca. But it's, oh, it's called a Fetch because it is, was utterly locked. It was sealed shut. 2,000 years, the, the, the toxic tribalism, the, the petty feuds have caused sub-tribes of Arabia to go extinct, finish each other off for, for no reason. For no reason. Beneath childish reasons. Just vendettas and vengeance that started with, you know, someone bumped someone somewhere, right? And they just ricocheted into mayhem. They would refuse to accept unity, refuse to accept peace. 
And somehow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 2,000 years later, Allah opens up for him. He grants him access to unify all of Arabia under a centralized leadership, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or you look at the people whose hearts were unlocked, very unlikely. Like Umar al Khattab, when someone felt that there was a soft spot in Umar, the persecutor Umar, before he was, radiallahu an, her husband said to her, like, are you crazy? Or are you like hopeful he's going to become Muslim? Like, she, he said to her, his dad's donkey will become Muslim before he becomes Muslim. Umar is not going to become Muslim. And Allah unlocked the, the heart of Umar. And Umar didn't just become any Muslim. May Allah be pleased with him, right? The right-hand man of the Prophet, والسلام, after Abu Bakr. Or Tufayl ibn Amr. Tufayl ibn Amr was another, you know, distinguished chief in Arabia of another tribe outside of Quraysh. When he came to Mecca, they sort of ran to him and said, don't listen to Muhammad. You listen to Muhammad, he's going to like brainwash you. He's going to entrance you and you don't listen to him. So he got so worked up by, you know, the, the fear they were stoking that he locked his ears. He took cotton or whatever he could find and he plugged his ears so he wouldn't hear a word that Muhammad had to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he enters Mecca. And as he's circling around the Kaaba, Allah opened up, right? Light bulb moment. He opened up the right idea for Tufayl. It's like, how dare they tell me I'm going to get tricked by Muhammad? He felt insulted. <laughs> Allah Azza wa Jal opened up that emotion inside him. I'm a, I'm a grown man. I'm a respected leader. I'm a poet. He's not just going to, you know, sell me some lie. And so he unplugged his ears and he listened to what the Prophet ﷺ had to say and he heard about the basic values of Islam, khutbatul haja, and he said, there's nothing better than what you're saying, O Muhammad. I'm on your program. I'm on your project. I'm with you. I'm accepting this religion. I even remember reading at that ayah, the ayah in Surah Fatir, when Allah said, whatever mercy he opens up for someone, nobody could stop it. And whatever mercy he withholds, nobody could send it. This was a, a Muslim political prisoner that was very uh, affluent before he went to prison. He was aristocratic, uh, wealthy, all of this. And so he's felt the top and the bottom of life, right? He says, I swear by Allah, I have experienced more bursts of Allah's mercy in this prison cell a fulfillment and joy and happiness, contentment, when none of the instruments of that are here, Right? I don't, I'm, I'm lonely. I'm scared. I'm cold. It's tight. I, all of that, nothing's here. Right? He says, then I have ever felt outside of prison when I had my family around and I was in my house with my family, had the respect and the prestige. He said, subhanAllah. And you see that. People that have the instruments of happiness, but it is locked away from them. It's so close, but so far. And some people that seemingly have no access to it, but Allah al-Fattah, the opener, grants access. They have full access to it like never before. And this is why, you know, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says something very beautiful about Allah's name al-Fattah, the perpetual opener, that Allah loves to open. And the default, the norm, the rule of thumb is that he's opening, not closing. Right? It's not like Allah, whatever Allah opens or whatever Allah closes into 50-50. No. He's saying the norm is Allah's always opening. He's so generous, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gives an example. He says, look. Allah opened for the human being one means of sustenance when they're in the mother's womb, which is that single umbilical cord. They get everything through there and everything is removed through, through just one source of life. He says, then a time comes, it's called childbirth, gets shut down. Allah closes that door to open two doors instead of it. The two pathways of the mother's milk. And then the, those two doors serve their function until the child eventually gets weaned off and he doesn't want the milk anymore and that gets shut down when the day comes that Allah shuts down those two doors, disinterests the child or interrupts the production, it is to open four doors in their place. Which is what? He says every drink boils down to water or milk or a combination of the two or that is their base, right? And all food boils down to meat and vegetation. They're all combinations of them or either or. He says, and then a person is, has those doors opened for them for a lifetime. However long they're destined to live. And Allah only closes those doors so that if you are a believer, I'm granting you now access to paradise, which the Prophet ﷺ said has eight doors. And so Allah does not close doors as much as He opens doors. And for the believer especially, 
he closes doors only to open more doors, to understand that. And there's so many examples of this beyond the scope of this khutbah. But it's our job to pause and recognize Allah wants to open doors for you. And Allah already is opening doors for you all the time. And that had it not been for him to write for you that raindrop, had him not to write for you that dollar amount, that rizq, it would not have come. It is locked away were it not for Al-Fatah. And he wants to. Isn't it enough that the greatest surah in the Quran is Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter through which you ask Allah for his blessings to open up the blessings in your life through this surah by repeating it day in and day out? Isn't that an indication? Isn't it enough that Allah grants you access around the clock to your own body? Access to benefit from the oxygen. You know, access every time the valve of your heart opens and closes, right? Access to the pathways when the blood leaves the heart to get to your eyes or wherever else it needs to supply with that. The times that Allah opens up for you the tightness of your chest and you don't even know why. How are you doing today? Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm getting better. Why? What changed? It's just getting better. Right or wrong? The worst days you've ever experienced, it was at when you first experienced it and then somehow it tapers off. Somehow the tightness opens up. Who did that? Why did that happen? That was just the generosity of Al-Fatah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are so many times where your income was interrupted or in jeopardy. And some of those times you didn't even recognize who opened up a new alternative for you for the continuity of your income. That was Al-Fatah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله. I want to try to leave you with three points, takeaways from revisiting or learning here and now, you know, this great name of Allah, Al-Fatah سبحانه وتعالى. The first of them is that you need to recognize that the greatest doors Allah opens are the doors of guidance and we're all locked out of them without Him. It's not because you were born Muslim. It's not because, you know, you decided to become Muslim. It's not because you're so intelligent. It's not. Right or wrong? You know, uh, wanting the truth is very different than finding the truth. I was... Uh, you know, coming across this academic professor who is, you know, a specialist in his field. <laughs> Outside of what I'm about to mention, you know, you would be impressed by him. He goes on to describe at great lengths that the Qur'an is mentioning things that are absolutely humanly impossible for anyone to know 1400 years ago. Archaeologically speaking, we dug up stuff later, or the Bible manuscripts finally, you know, surfaced or got translated, and then... So all this stuff, you measure it all up, there's no way the Qur'an, simply Muhammad, there had to be divine origin, of course, we know this, right? The Qur'an's a miracle. But he's saying the Qur'an's facts could not be 1400 years ago. No man could know that. And therefore, all the historians are wrong. The Qur'an must have been much later than that. <laughs> Look at how he took it, right? The Qur'an must have been 500 years ago, right? It's all a, a trans-historical conspiracy. Everybody, everywhere, you know, is unintelligent and I figured it out. It's from Allah, right? There are people who know Islam better than you, more intelligent than you, have higher IQs than you, but Allah didn't open that door for them. But He opened it for you. Yes, He opened it for everyone in the sense that He made the truth available. Interestingly, in Sahih al-Bukhari, it is stated that of what remained from the signs or the foretelling of Muhammad in the previous scripture, the Torah, it says that Allah will not pull his soul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahaba said, we found like leftovers from the Torah that said, وَلَنْ يَقْبِضَهُ اللَّهُ حَتَّى يُقِيمَ بِهِ الْمِلَّةَ الْعَوْجَاءَ Allah will not allow him to die until he corrects using him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the crooked path, the right way of God, clarifies it for the world. So you, the truth would be available. And it actually says, وَيَفْتَحُ بِهِ أَعْيُنًا عُمْيًا and opening up with it eyes that were blind, blind from guidance. You can't get it if Allah doesn't show it to you, right? And ears that are deaf and hearts that are as hard as the stones of the mountains around them. 
Allah opened all those possibilities up by providing the message to the world. Their souls were locked in shirk, locked up in superstition and all of that. But that was just part of it. Availability isn't all. The fact that Allah opens up for you the rizq of the heart, provides for your heart the humility and the guidance to accept it, that is the number one reason why you should be enamored. You should adore Al-Fattah, the opener, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Day and night there are reasons for you to lose your faith. But he's opening up for you reasons to stay on the faith. New reasons, new motivation. That's the first point. The second of them, appreciate how Allah has opened unique doors for you. You know, Imam Malik ibn Anas, rahimahullah, used to say, Allah sometimes opens up for someone a big share of prayer and not fasting. I have it in me to pray the whole night, but I can't fast, right? Meaning the voluntary fasting, extra fasting. And some people, Allah opens the door of sadaqah for them. They're capable of sadaqah and not, he says, and Allah opens for some people the door of jihad to sacrifice even their own lives, but they can't do other things, subhanAllah. He says, Allah qassam, he divided when he opened up and he distributed your actions the same way he divides your rizq, your sustenance, your livelihoods. So see what Allah has portioned for you and be content and appreciative of that. He says, Allah has granted me certain knowledge. Other people didn't have the chance sort of to, to develop this. He says, and I'm content with what Allah gave me. So be content, appreciate. And when you ask of him, use that name. The name of Al-Fattah. Oh, Fattah, you've always been opening doors for me. Open for me this door. Open for me that door. Whenever you're stuck, you have a work decision. You have a family dilemma. Say, Ya Fattah, Ya Allah, I'm at a roadblock. I'm at a dead end. Open up this door for me. You know, Allah's name, Al-Fattah, is also about, as we said, unanticipated difficulties. You think you're in the masjid and it's mission accomplished. No, there's things that may deprive you of opportunity, even if it's right in front of you. And also Allah's name, Al-Fattah, is to open up for you ways to work through the difficulty after it lands. Students, when you're in exams, you're struggling. You know, many people are, they're study, they're ready, they're top of their class, the exam starts, they draw a blank from anxiety or whatever other reason. Stop, pause, say, Ya Allah, open up the pockets of my brain. Help me understand. It is said that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, who was you know, a truly distinguished scholar, a unique scholar in Islamic history, among the many great scholars Allah has blessed this ummah with, whenever he would get stuck on an issue trying to understand something, a scholarly you know, uh, you know, high level subject or point, he would go to an abandoned masjid to show his poverty in front of Allah, away from everybody, and seek forgiveness and say, O oh, teacher of Ibrahim, teach me. Right? Who, who, who turned the lights on for Ibrahim alayhi salam? There was nobody there. He was the only believer on the face of the earth. So he's saying, O oh, teacher of Ibrahim, who had no teachers on the ground, teach me. Ya mufahima Sulaiman fahimni. O oh, you who gave grant understanding to Sulaiman, to Solomon, grant me understanding. Who did Sulaiman alayhi salam have? Allah points out in the Quran that at the time his teacher was his father, Dawood, David, and he was correcting his father here and there, and right? And all so, oh, you who granted understanding without the instruments to Sulaiman, grant me understanding. You know, it is said, and I'm, I'm running out of time here. It is said that, you know, Ibn, Ibn Hajar, who has the crown commentary, all scholars throughout history recognize there's no commentary on Sayyid al-Bukhari that could ever outdo, you know, the commentary of Ibn Hajar. Ibn Hajar called that world famous commentary on Sayyid al-Bukhari, the most reliable hadith book, he called it Fath al-Bari, the opening of our creator. Because he did his effort, he read through it, he said, I read through it 10, 13 times trying to extract every last lesson, and I realized that Allah has granted me a lot here that he hasn't granted others and probably will not grant me anymore, so I just stopped and I compiled it there and I called it the Fath, what Allah has opened me up to. And finally, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Prophet ﷺ said, there used to be people of the nation before you that are muhaddathun. They just have inspiration that just comes to them. And they're not prophets, not inspiration that will overturn or overrule the Quran and Sunnah, but just divinely inspired. In another hadith, he says, Allah has caused the truth to flow on the tongue and heart of Umar, but there is no prophet after me. Think about that. How did Umar do what he did? Umar created a man in the desert who was an alcoholic, radiallahu anhu, created a superior bureaucracy in the Roman Empire out of nowhere. No civilization, no tools, nothing. Why? Allah opened that up. Allah inspired him. 
So call upon Allah to inspire you. You know, we often brag of Michael Hartz, the hundred most influential people in the world, and he puts Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as number one. You may not notice that a non-prophet, Umar al-Khattab, in the middle of nowhere, isolated Arabia, was in the top 50. How did this happen? This is what Allah azza wa opened for him. And my closing message to you is, as you call upon Allah as al-Fattah, also try to reflect that fatih in your life. The Prophet sallallahu said, Allah allows that some of his servants are mafatihu lil khayr. They are keys for goodness. They unlock goodness where they turn. And they lock evil wherever they turn. And among God's servants are those who unlock evil wherever they turn. Wherever they go, there's problems. There's hard feelings. There's discomfort. There's misguidance, right? And they are locks on good. He said, so congratulations to those who are keys for good, locks on evil. May we be of them. And he said, doomed are those who are the opposite. May we never be of them. Allahumma ameen.